y you know, if um, a child is hungry, it's pretty easy as to what to do about it. You, you feed that child. If somebody's homeless, you do a shelter and you do case management to, to help move them off the streets to something better. Um, if the tax code is changing and public assistance is moving away from programs into the tax code, it's pretty easy to realize that an organization like LUM needs to be in, involved in helping make sure people get their tax returns done and that they access their um, benefits and credits that are, that are uh, designated for them. H however, with this issue of family and marriage and the increasing uh, dissolution of marriage, um, it, it's a lot more difficult uh, to learn what to do and where to go. Um, this is not the whole issue of the poverty pie, but it's a significant issue that we on the LUM board and on the staff uh, have felt for some time now um, is playing more and more into the lives of the children and families that we serve. And so what we are attempting to do today is to begin a conversation and that uh, it be a conversation <coughs> that is not necessarily anecdotally based but is much based in the social scientific research as we can possibly get it to be. And so in order to help us along that way and to get the conversation started is uh, Dr. Sarah Mastillo. Now, Dr. Mastillo uh, is a very, very recent uh, friend to Lafayette Urban Ministry. She is on our board of directors representing St. Thomas Aquinas Parish. Uh, she's also an associate professor of sociology at Purdue, and uh, Sarah received her PhD from Duke University in 2001. Uh, her specializations are health and mental health, uh, quantitative methods in children and youth. Uh, she teaches, and I, I, want, I just want to go through this uh, list of courses that she teaches so you can be very impressed because <laughs> I, I sure am. Uh, they, they are all uh, um, upper level courses, uh, sociology, statistical methods, introduction, introduction to methods of social research, social statistics, and categorical data analysis. So uh, Sarah is somebody whose uh, background and whose life is uh, very deeply rooted in, in uh, research and research about families and children. Uh, she joined the faculty at Purdue in 2007. Uh, she has published in journals such as the Journal of Marriage and Family, uh, the American Journal of Sociology, and the Archives of General Psychiatry. Um, she is uh, uh, working on several statistical pro pro projects um, and uh, has a very real um, interest and expertise in the area of children and families. So we're glad that you're with us today, Sarah. Thank you for spending the time during this very, very busy time at Purdue and in your life. And we're going to turn the uh, floor over to you. Now. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sarah Mastilla. Thank you, Dr. Um, as Joe said, in my research life at Purdue, I study children and families, and the main thing that I focus on is instability in, child, in children's lives, and the effects of different types of instability on child outcomes. Most of the outcomes that I study are health and mental health, uh, but today we're going to talk about a lot of different kinds of outcomes. Uh, so my perspective, I focus on children. I'm interested in child outcomes. Uh, I don't study adults, I don't study adult outcomes, so the way that I am coming at this topic today is from child perspective. Most of what we're going to talk about is about adults. We're going to talk about what parents are doing, um, but, but the way that I approach it is from an interest in how does this affect children. Uh, 
I should say that marriage and you know, a lot of the statistics that I'm going to put up are going to talk about demographic shifts and changes in marriage, and uh, that is not my specialty. My specialty is the child outcomes. Um, so some of this, when I was putting together the presentation, some of this information was actually new to me. <laughs> um, I also want to say before I even get started that it, you know, when Joe asked me if I would speak about this. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. And then when I started trying to put together a presentation on it, I realized exactly what I had stepped into. Um, <laughs> and I kind of wondered if he really liked me or not. But the, talking about the issue of single parenthood, talking about the issue of marriage and the family and how this affects children is a very thorny issue. It involves uh, personal beliefs. It involves religious beliefs. It involves moral beliefs political beliefs, all kinds of, you know, touches on all these different areas. And so your reactions to what we talk about today will likely be influenced by your religious tradition and your <coughs> political um, opinions and, and your personal history. So I'm trying to approach this from a very scientific perspective. I'm going to tell you about things that I know to be true um, and, and try to stay away from the thornier issues and leave that for the people that are following me who are much more qualified to deal with uh, the, the moral and religious implications of, of what we're going to talk about right now. So to start off with, um, as you all probably know, the reason why Joe wanted to talk about this today is that in recent years there has been a huge demographic shift in non-marital childbearing, childbearing outside of marriage. Um, it has increased dramatically in the U.S. during the latter half of the 20th century. Um, and it has changed the whole context of the way that children are being raised in the U.S. Um, the proportion of all children born to unmarried parents grew tenfold from 1940 to 2007. That is, it was about 4% in 1940 and about 40% in 2007. So we have experienced a huge shift in the context of the, the family structure that children are being raised in. In 2009, more than half of children born to women under 30 were born outside of marriage. Uh, more than half. So this is a big, big demographic shift. And I'll show you a picture to illustrate that a little better. Over here is 1940. These are every two years up to 2006. So pretty flat up until almost about 1960. Uh, and then it's been a pretty linear increase since then. And there's no signs of this slowing down either. In terms of the big picture, in terms of defining what does it mean, non-marital births, usually when you talk about non-marital births, people immediately think of teen pregnancy. And teen pregnancy is a big part of non-marital childbearing. Uh, but it's not as big of a part as you would think, and it's actually becoming a smaller part every day. Non-marital births can be first births, second births, third births, fourth births. They can happen to women who have never been married. They can happen to women who are divorced. They can happen to women who are separated or cohabitating. Um, they can happen to, and I shouldn't just say women, they happen to women and men. They happen to couples. Um, and it can be, uh, they can have one birth inside of a marriage and then another birth outside of a marriage. They may experience births with different partnerships over time. Um, so it's not just teen pregnancies that we're talking about. And then to give you an idea of kind of what this means in terms of the big picture of what's going on in the U.S., uh, overall there's 73.7 million children in the U.S. total. Um, this was in 2007. About 68% of them lived with both married parents in the home. 2.9% uh, lived with cohabitating parents. 17.9% lived with just the mother and 26 with just the father. So about 20% of kids in single parent homes, um, single parent homes and then an additional three with cohabitating parents. So it's still the case that the majority are in two parent biological families, but these percentages of single parent families are increasing. Why is this taking place? That's the first question. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach that. Um, why is this taking place? But some things that, no matter what your tradition or what your opinions are, that, that most experts at least tend to agree on, is that there, we have been experiencing a cultural shift in the United States um, and in, in, in some other countries as well, uh, particularly the decline of the shotgun wedding. So one, you know, one question that's probably going to come up is how much of this increase is due to an increase in premarital sex and how much is due to other factors? And the truth is, is that it's 
more of it is due to fewer people getting married than more people having premarital sex. That is, when people get pregnant now, they don't feel the same cultural pressure to get married as they did um, in previous years. And there was a great example, I just read an article on this that cited a statistic that 50 years ago, 50 years ago, one third of marriages were precipitated by pregnancy. So it's not the case that all of a sudden people are just having premarital sex and they didn't do that before. Um, it's a bigger part of it is that when it happened before, people felt compelled to get married. And people don't feel that same, um, the, that same pressure to get married in the case of pregnancy anymore. So the decline of the shotgun wedding. Now there's all kinds of theories and ideas about why this cultural shift has taken place. Um, they largely, the ideas are, you know, center around changing roles of men and women. So women have entered the labor force, um, relationship roles have changed. Uh, women no longer necessarily have to rely on men for economic support. Um, there's educational differences. For example, uh, women are much more likely now to graduate from college than men. There's more females entering college and there's more females graduating from college than there are, than there are males. Um, so women are becoming more educated than men. Increased age at first marriage has a lot to do with this. Uh, it used to be the case, uh, you know, 1940, what was the age of first marriage? 20. Um, and now it's something like 27. That's a big difference. That's a lot of years to, uh, to not be married and to be in relationships. The lack of marriageable men is, is an interesting one. Uh, and this, this one I struggled with. I was like, oh boy, am I really going to put that up there? But let me, let me define it. Let me define it. Um, literally, in, if you kind of break it down by subgroups, if you look at the ratio of women to men in you know, the 20, 30, 40 age groups, literally, like among African Americans, there are more women than men in those age groups, demographically. So there are fewer, literally fewer men to marry for every woman of that age. Then if you take it a step further, and if, if you define marriageable man as a man who is gainfully employed and stably employed, then it decreases those eligibility numbers even further. There are fewer men who are stably employed in those age groups than there used to be. So that is what is meant by lack of marriageable men. Um, and then contraception, this is another thorny one, uh, depending on, you know, there's kind of two sides to this issue. That Some people believe that um, the advent of contraception, of the pill, you know, has increased this problem. It's decoupled uh, parenthood from sexual activity um, and that that's part of the problem. Other people believe that lack of access to contraception is the bigger problem and that if women had more access and it was more easily available, um, then that would you know that that's that's the bigger issue. So there's two sides to that to that one, um, kind of depending on where you're coming from. So the debate. Some people disagree about whether this increase in non-marital childbearing is cause for concern. Which over the course of the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you that that's incorrect. But at one end, people argue that this increase in non-marital birth reflects liberation. It reflects economic independence, the sexual revolution, and individual freedom. Uh, from this perspective, unmarried parents could be the same as married parents, that it's just a piece of paper and we may or may not need it. Um, implicit in this argument, then, is that marriage as an institution or as a covenant is unnecessary for raising children. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum are people who argue that non-marital births are the product of casual relationships by people who are lacking in commitment, lacking in a sense of responsibility, uh, who cannot or won't, fathers who cannot and will not support their children financially or emotionally. Um, from this perspective, marriage itself as an institution is necessary for healthy families. It, marriage is associated with stronger parenting um, and an increase in commitment and stability and finances. Um, and further from this perspective, um, the increase in non-marital childbearing may also be contributing to the persistence of class and race, racial inequalities in the U.S. I'm going to tell you that neither of these is completely accurate. But before I do that, I'm going to say on top of these 
there's scientific and political debates, there's obviously also religious and moral debates as well, because everything we're talking about here in the background is premarital sex, contraception, uh, cohabitation, and marriage as an institution. So there's obviously, you know, political background, uh, scientific background, and a religious moral background as well. So questions I'd like to talk about. Uh, how do the children of non-marital births fare? That's the big answer to the question is, is this a problem or not? It's a problem if it's a problem for these kids. And then if it is a problem for the kids, what are the mechanisms and pathways that are potentially responsible for the effect? So this is very much a class-based phenomenon. This is very much has to do with education and income. 41% uh, of never married mother families with children under 18 have income below the poverty level. So, and I'm, I'm focusing on women here, which I feel bad about, but we'll, we'll get to men in a little bit, because uh, obviously it takes two to you know, create this situation. But um, college-educated women, very unlikely to have a non-marital birth. Uh, women with, without a high school diploma, 43% um, of women with a high school diploma or less have a non-marital birth. And then age. So as I said a few minutes ago, one of the most interesting shifts is that for in the 80s and kind of into the 90s, teen pregnancy was the big focus. We we're all focused on you know, preventing teen pregnancy. Uh, and teen pregnancy is still an issue. Teen pregnancy is pretty stagnant right now. And so it hasn't, it's not that teen pregnancy has improved. It's that more older women are having non-marital births. So the increase in non-marital births is not because of teens. It's because of women largely in their 20s. So if you look at this graph, this is the percentage of all non-marital births that are teen pregnancies. So it's 23%. That means the other 77 is women who are not teenagers. And again, we're focusing on mothers here. Um, but if you will, it's from t age 20 to 24, 38%. And then 25 to 29, 22%. So women in their 20s comprise over half of this pie, over half of this non-marital birth pie. And in terms of looking at the increase in non-marital births, it is largely attributable to single women in their 20s. And then here's uh, some breakdown by religious tradition. Um, this is a little bit different. This is not percentage of births. This is percentage of women who have a non-marital birth. Um, so a little bit different percentage here. Um, but so this is, for example, 10% um, of white Catholic women experience a non-marital birth compared to 19% of women who don't identify with a religious tradition. Um, so if we compare the numbers by race and ethnicity across these groups, um, the numbers for Hispanics are pretty consistent regardless of religious tradition. Um, black women who don't have a religious tradition are more likely um, than black Catholic or black Protestant women to have a non-marital birth. Um, what else? What else do we want to say here? Uh, and white women are, you know, outside of religious tradition, much more likely than women in a, white women in a religious tradition to experience a non-marital birth. So, race and ethnicity being a member of a racial or ethnic minority increases the risk. Um, age, women in their twenties uh, are pushing this rise um, in non-marital births. Uh, education and income class, this is largely women who are lower income and lower levels of education. So what does this mean? What does this mean for kids? Uh, I'm sure there's single parents sitting here and you may be saying, my kid's fine, why are we <laughs> talking about this? Um, most kids from these families will be fine. Most kids will grow up and be well-adjusted and productive and be okay. A substantial minority will not. Children living in single-parent homes, and I read a great quote on this. Um, you know, there, a lot of people don't trust social science research because there's, you know, there's all these different findings and sometimes things conflict and how do we really know what the truth is. And um, The answers that you get to questions depend on the methodology used and the questions asked and the measures and the sample. Uh, but pretty much this one is this one is on solid ground that, that almost every study 
from every perspective and every sample with every measure shows that kids from single parent homes are at increased risk of doing poorly in school, of having emotional and behavioral problems, of becoming teenage parents themselves, of having a poverty level income both as a child and then when they grow into adulthood um, compared to children living with married biological parents. So this one, the science is in. The answers are really clear. There's not a lot of doubt about this. The question then, of course, is which kids are the ones doing fine and which kids are the ones that are experiencing these problems. So teasing that out is a kind of more of the question. We know that this is happening. It's just who, which ones of these kids are at particular risk. So let me myth bust here for a minute. Um, you know, in addition to the myth about that this is all being driven by teenage pregnancies, the other myth is that these pregnancies are all the result of casual encounters, that this is all about casual sex. And I'm here to tell you that it's not. The vast majority of non-marital births are conceived in a romantic relationship. Um, about 51% of couples are cohabitating at the time that they conceive. Um, and then another 31% are in a you know, a one-on-one -on -one romantic, you know, committed relationship, um, but living apart. So that's over 80% are in a relationship at the time that their child was conceived. So it is a myth that these are, that most of these births are the result of casual encounters. They are not. But cohabitating partnerships are significantly more likely to dissolve compared to marital relationships. Um, and that's just another one of those things that's a fact. People may look at it like, oh, it's just a piece of paper, but cohabitating relationships are more likely to split than marital relationships. Um, and when they do split, cohabitating relationships are much less likely to stay in a co-parenting relationship, uh, even then compared to a divorce. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. But so, so a couple layers of things here that... Um, these children are being born usually within some kind of relationship. Uh, but those relationships tend to be cohabitating relationships. Those relationships are more likely to dissolve. And then when they do dissolve, uh, they're less likely to stay as co-parents. So instability. These types of partnerships that are resulting in these non-marital births are characterized by economic and relationship instability. Five years after the birth, a third of fathers have virtually disappeared from their children's lives. Uh, and this is largely because of the breakup with the mom. So when the parents break up and they were in a cohabitating relationship, they are less likely to stay in touch with each other. And then you bring in new partnerships. New partnerships, new children. Uh, maybe the new partnership brings children. Maybe it creates children. Uh, this creates very complex situations with multiple connections and, and many, many balls to juggle. So parents, in terms of the couples of these non-marital babies, these cohabitating romantically involved couples, they tend to have lower incomes, they tend to have lower levels of education, and they tend to have unstable employment, which does not help make a stable union. This brings a lot of stress into the relationship, it brings a lot of conflict, low <coughs> income, breeds conflict in relationships. It also means unstable housing, um, maybe people going to live with mom for a while, uh, going to live with other family members. It creates instability. And then in terms of mothers, mothers who are on their own, few mothers who are on their own single parenting make enough to support their kids um, at, what did I say, twice the federal poverty level. They're also not able to accumulate any assets, to accumulate any savings. And so then when something goes wrong, when the things that you know, naturally happen to all of us in life go wrong, there's no resources to deal with them. So they often rely on friends or family or churches or organizations for help in these situations because they just can't get ahead of things. Um, the case is different for college graduates, of course. As I said before, there is a class divide here that college graduates still tend to put marriage before childbearing. And so this is largely happening to lower income families, lower income individuals, and then this is perpetuating the cycle of poverty because those individuals are more likely to stay in poverty and then their children are more likely to be in poverty. In terms of fathers, there is a very strong relationship between education and income um, and marriage in men. 
So having an education and an income makes a man more marriageable, as we talked about before. Um, and then in terms of the, man, the men themselves, it makes them more likely to get married, having an education and, a, and a, um, uh, an income. Beyond marriage, there's a strong relationship between earnings and involvement with children among those who don't get married. So those who are in cohabitating relationships, um, and then even if the relationship dissolves, men with higher earnings are much more likely to stay involved with their children than men with lower earnings. Men with lower earnings are more likely to lose contact with their kids, and they're also less likely to pay child support. Again, creating more instability and perpetuating the cycle of poverty, which has led some to say men aren't worth what they used to be. <laughs> so economic instability and relationship instability, these things go hand in hand. The poorer you are, the more likely you are to have relationship instability because of all the stresses that go with poverty, because maybe you yourself grew up in a single parent home and didn't see a good model for healthy relationships. Um, the inability to maintain a healthy relationship is a major predictor of breakup. Okay, and that doesn't sound like rocket science. Um, but people of lower income and lower levels of education, people who came themselves from single parent homes, are more likely to have poor relationship skills. Uh, so relationship skills is an issue. It's a predictor of breakup. And then the big one is, after breakup, quality of the relationship between the partners predicts whether dad is going to stay involved or not. So how well mom and dad get along, even after a breakup, predicts whether dad's going to stay involved or not. And that you know kind of makes sense if you think about it, if there's a high level of conflict, if there's a lot of resentment, if there's fighting, and bleh, um, men are much more likely to walk away and not stay involved. Uh, and many studies have found relationship quality, both when parents are together and when they're not, to be a strong predictor of child outcomes. So how good mom and dad's relationship is when people are married, uh, how good the partner's relationship is when mom and dad are cohabitating, and then how good mom and dad get along when they're divorced or separated or you know when their relationship has broken up has a big impact on how children do. So for example, um, I've got two measures here. of uh, One is called social competence and one is school engagement. Um, social competence it kind of involves a lot of different it's a composite measure of you know how, how well children do socially. Um, and this is broken down by uh, percent of the federal poverty line. So 0 to 200 percent, 2 to 300 percent, and 3 to 400 percent. And it's the bars, the individual bars here are whether the parents rate themselves as completely happy, very happy, fairly happy, or not too happy. And this combines parents who are married, parents who are cohabitating, and parents who are dissolved. What it shows is that in every case, you know, for every um, income bracket here, parents who rate themselves as being very happy with one another, or very happy in their relationship with the other parent, have children who are more socially competent compared to lower levels of happiness. So kind of in all, kids who are, you know, have higher income tend to be more socially competent, which you can see across all of these. But within each group, parents who are happy have children who are better adjusted compared to parents who are not happy. So whether they are married, whether they are cohabitating, or whether they are just co-parenting, the better they get along, the more well-adjusted their children are. And then this one is, school, is kind of the same thing for school engagement, and this one is done by race and ethnicity rather than um, by percent of the poverty level. But again, you see that in terms of how engaged the children are in school, the better the parents' relationship, the more engaged the kids are in school for all racial ethnic groups here. And the differences are, so for, for black, non-Hispanic kids, if, they, if their parents are completely happy with each other, about 81% of the kids are involved in school or engaged in school, compared to about 67% of kids whose parents are not too happy. So it makes a difference. These are two child outcomes, social competence and school engagement. But there are a whole host of child outcomes that are associated with single parent families, and particularly these unstable single parent families. Uh, studies show that children who grow up in single mother and cohabitating families fare worse than children in married 
couple families, married couple biological parent families. Uh, they tend to have poor physical health, believe it or not, more acute health conditions and more chronic health conditions. Educational issues. Children from single parent families, on average, tend to have lower achievement, so they have lower test scores, um, lower grades, lower GPAs. Um, and then they also have lower educational attainment, which means they're less likely to graduate from high school, less likely to go to college, less likely to get, you know, to get more education. They're also more likely to have emotional and behavioral issues. Um, they're more likely, much more likely to experience a teen pregnancy, and they are more likely to continue the cycle of poverty to themselves live in poverty as they age. So to recap all of this, um, there's been a dramatic rise in non-marital births, particularly among women in their 20s. Uh, most parents are in a romantic relationship at the time their child is conceived and the time their child is born. These partnerships are characterized by high levels of economic and relationship instability, though. And that's the thing, if you take nothing else from this, that's the thing that, that, that I want you to think about, is that these families, these partnerships, these children are being born into a high degree of economic and relationship instability. Most of these partnerships dissolve and the fathers often fail to stay involved. A lot of that is predicted by finances and by relationship with the mother. Again, the relationship and economic instability. Children in these situations are at risk for a whole host of adverse outcomes. School problems, mental health problems, behavior problems, teen pregnancy, poverty. And again, what we're not talking about here is, we're not talking about a rise in teen pregnancy. Teen pregnancy is still a problem. Uh, it's still, it's basically the same problem that it has been for a while. But it's not responsible for the increase we are seeing now. Um, in 1970, 50% of non-marital births were the result of teen pregnancy, and now it's about 23%. Uh, we're also not talking about Murphy Brown, for those of you who uh, can get that cultural reference, um, is implementing school-based, community-based, and church-based programs that teach people, I'm going to say women, but men too, uh, teach people about the risks and pitfalls of non-marital childbearing. Uh, for example, teaching women that if you have a non-marital birth, you are less likely to ever get married. Uh, it impacts your risk of staying in poverty. It impacts you know, your chances of getting married. Um, it, it, to educate women and men about the problems that this causes for themselves as well as potentially for their children. Um, another one that's been studied and shown to have success is expanding premarital programs for couples. Um, so like we have, you know, every couple that gets married in the Catholic Church, we have to do a, you know, a program before we get married. Um, premarital programs for couples uh, have been shown to improve marriage quality and to reduce rates of divorce. So they tend to create stronger unions. Um, and then family planning services, and you know, depending on your beliefs there, that can mean different things to different people. It can mean teaching people about natural family planning. It can be teaching people about contraception, providing access to contraception. Um, but that's another layer of prevention. And then in terms of strategies for improvements, things we can do for parents once they're in that situation. Um, promoting family stability among unwed parents is one of the top things that can be done. Um, and again, this, uh, these are you know, not just kind of opinions, these are research-based claims that there have been programs developed and these have been studied and evaluated in, you know, in clinical trials with control groups that there are relationship programs that provide support to couples when they're in this situation that can help them learn how to communicate with each other, help them learn relationship skills that maybe they never learned when they were growing up, help them learn how to deal with conflict better, uh, and that makes them more likely to then stay together. And then there's programs that encourage fathers' involvement. So even if the relationship doesn't stay together, encouraging dads to stay committed to their children and stay committed to the relationship. And again, this is also then tied to relationship skills that the better mom and dad can get along, then even if they split, they're more likely to stay in a co-parenting relationship. Beyond that, whether, you know, maybe dad doesn't stay involved or maybe dad's marginally involved, then supporting single mothers and their children. Um, 
you know, depending on where you fall politically, you may believe that the government should do this, you may believe that churches should do this, or private organizations should do this, no matter where you think it should come from. Uh, food aid, health care, housing assistance, child care, and education programs have all been shown to be effective in helping women and children who are in this situation. And that means, in, from my perspective, improving child outcomes. So kids who are in stable child care, uh, who have access to educational support, uh, who are in stable housing, who have decent health care, all have better outcomes than children who don't. So it helps mitigate the risk uh, that these kids are in. And then the last one is increasing education and income potential among the single parents. So providing programs um, for student parents that provide tuition assistance, so maybe they can go to community college or maybe they can pick up a trade or get some training in a program. Um, and programs that are particularly successful are ones that emphasize uh, well-paying trades that maybe only require a year of education, a post-secondary education, or you know maybe an apprenticeship. Uh, I just read an article about we should be telling everybody to become a plumber because you can start doing it at 18. You don't have to go to you don't even have to go to community college for it. You can start doing you know you can do training on the job. You do a paid apprenticeship and you can make a lot of money as a plumber. So you know there are. There are options for people that are in this situation that if they had some guidance, if they had some counseling, some vocational counseling, could be steered into avenues that will be more lucrative for them with a lower educational commitment. So emphasis on well-paying trades that require, um, you know, little extra education. I talked to a woman uh, a couple weeks ago who was in a nursing assistance program, and she was killing herself to, she's a single mom and uh, had you know two little ones in child care that she was struggling to pay for and she was taking out loans to go to Ivy Tech for this nursing assistant program and I said, how much do you think you're going to make when you're done? And, and she said, you know, something like $8 an hour or $8.50 an hour. And I'm thinking, why are you doing nursing assistance? Like, there are so many other things that you could do with your kids in daycare. There are other things you could be getting trained for that are going to pay you better. Um, and they're going to you know, be a much, much better payoff for you and much more likely to get you out of this cycle of poverty that you're in. And so I think you know, providing good information to people about, you know, don't pick that program, pick this one, you'll do better. And then strategies to children. Um, the single best strategy, and I can say this as somebody who, you know, most of what I study, I very technically call uh, the effects of parent garbage on child outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, as somebody who studies parent level risk factors and child outcomes, I can tell you that the, the single biggest predictor, the single best thing we can do for kids is to improve the lives of their parents. Because the more stable their parents are, the more stable their home life is, the better off they are going to be. Um, beyond that though, targeted interventions to keep kids in school, to model healthy relationships, to provide mentorship. Um, access to emotional and behavioral health, treatment when appropriate, things like that are all good. And LUM, we have some great examples here. Uh, their fifth quarter program, their tutoring, their summer camp, all of these things that LUM provides, um, you know, fills some of these gaps. That it can't make their home life better, but it can help them do better in school. And if they do better in school, then they are more likely to get out of, you know, out of this cycle. Those presentations. We do have some official responders who are somewhat prepared to respond, and then after that we will open it up to a broader discussion. And, and I hope, Sarah, you're able to stick around. Is that oh, possible? Yeah. Okay, so that uh, we're, the we're not finished with you. Uh, Pablo knows how to black the screen. Which one? There's a special button up here. <laughs> the, bo the bottom button. Is it, oh, it won't work. It's not on PowerPoint. Sorry. Okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> We can uh, always black it with the uh, on-off switch. There we go. <laughs> which uh, will go off uh, immediately. But before we, we get into that uh, response and uh, discussion time, I, I do want to make a few introductions. And um, First of all, I, I want to mention that Dr. Jim Davidson is here with us. And uh, Jim is now a retired uh, sociologist of religion from Purdue. Uh, but uh, we, we 
very uh, endearingly consider Jim one of the founding fathers of the Lafayette Urban Ministry, um, who was involved in an early evaluation that developed our board structure uh, back in the early 1970s. And uh, really, ever since that time, there has been this uh, very close relationship between uh, Lafayette Urban Ministry and the Department of Sociology. And uh, Jim and others in, in the department through the years have really helped what we do here have a, a real powerful sense of integrity to it. And so we, we thank you, Jim, for what you started, and Sarah, what you're continuing, um, this, this great relationship between the church community and, uh, and the sociology department at Purdue. Um, we do have a few staff members here as well. Uh, Eileen uh, hessian Weiss, who is in the back, who is our business manager. Eileen uh, from St. Mary uh, Cathedral. Uh, Sandra Donnell, uh, who is there, raise your She directs our Achieve program, does Lung Camp, and also directs our Tax Assistance program. Uh, we have a re recently, oh, we have Ron Smith, who is uh, uh, brand new on LUM staff from Faith Presbyterian Church, and uh, Ron is doing Jubilee Christmas, Hunger Hike, and also Assistance Tax Program Director, so Ron, glad you're able to break away and be with us today. A recently retired member of the staff, the ever-energetic Patty O'Callaghan, uh, who still is not gone. She's still with us, and we're happy to be here. You're with us, and uh, a soon-to-be member of the LUM staff, uh, Susan Briette, uh, who will be leaving Senator Luger's staff to come on, and uh, Susan will be doing with us um, uh, our public policy work, uh, a new area of helping individuals uh, obtain legal immigration to the United States. That's an expertise she had with the, the Senator's staff, and she's also going to be coordinating next year the Community Thanksgiving Program. So staff members, glad you are here with us as well. Uh, my, oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing Pablo. Okay, <laughs> we are over there looking up. Uh, Pablo is brand new. He's been with us for, for a couple months as our new quarter time director of social media. So if you're noticing you're getting more emails from mom. Um, uh, it says Joe, but it's, it's really from <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pablo, glad that you're here. And uh, very soon uh, you will be seeing us uh, have a greater presence on Facebook and be tweeting more as well. So uh, Paul will be uh, the guy behind that. Um, so with with that, so, and, and, and let me also mention to each of you who are pastors or church staff, we are uh, absolutely delighted. I know how busy you all are and uh, that you could break away for an hour and a half or two hours really means a lot to us. Um, our intention as staff people uh, here is, is really just to, to listen. Uh, to listen to Sarah, to listen to the responders, and then to listen to, to the discussion. We will have the same presentation uh, later in September to our board of directors. And uh, again, our, our purpose there will be to listen to how the board responds uh, to all this. And uh, I don't know what, if anything, will, will come out of this. Um, but uh, sometimes just by some good discussion, by learning some things and listening, uh, some things uh, do happen. So with that said, um, one of our uh, responders, uh, Pastor Justin from Dayton, and he's Devlin Schlesen, I don't have it down yet, <laughs> new to our community, but he got uh, called away um, uh, with a uh, uh, member of his congregation in the hospital, so he's not able to be with us. But Pastor uh, James Foster is with us, and Pastor uh, Clorinda Crawford, uh, from Congress Street is with us. So who wants to go first? How about how about Jim? You're up close, uh, James. So <laughs> why don't why don't you come on up? The podium is yours, and let us know what you thought about uh, the presentation. Oh, it's too much. What's it? No, it's, it's important. Good. Well, just like uh, most of the rest of us, uh, very very enlightening uh, figures like that. When you're working in the grassroots of things, you have no idea what the big picture looks like, and it can be a little scary sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I really, really appreciate uh, those things. The thing that came to my mind is, is, is in a, a black church, and I can't speak for all black churches, but I can speak from my experience, is that we're working with the families, and one of the things that uh, I was recently enlightened on was just. Uh, just a perspective from the scriptures about working with 
individuals, working with uh, church, uh, families, then church, and then community. And so keeping all those in mind uh, really helps me think that the solution is, is not in one particular perspective, but some combination of those. And especially in light of the fact that uh, uh, at our church, we've got families who we know, or we've got single parents who we know uh, we're trying to support and we're trying to help. And I think one of the enlightening things is that, boy, if we're trying to do that, when I see those statistics, I think one of the things that we're challenged with is uh, not only economics, we've got more and more people joining our church. I think we can, everybody in the community uh, experiences the influx of, of folks coming from the Chicago area and, and looking for uh, the benefits and that sort of thing. And, and if we get some members in the church who are in need and the increased numbers of need and not the increased numbers of supporting families and that sort of thing, then resources come to my mind, the lack of resources. And, uh, and I think our limited resources is, is, is that challenge because we've got people who want to help. We've got people who would like to help, but we just don't have the resources that I believe some other churches have. And I think that gives us a kind of a unique situation in, in terms of uh, the enlightenment of, of what those statistics look like. Um, we look at those numbers and, and the lack of resources there. Uh, one of the things, uh, uh, we, we just just thankful <laughs> thankful for the hope that comes with our faith uh, in light of we're going to do whatever we can and whatever we can we, we're going to pray that it increases we, we know about the uh, the uh, miracle in the Bible about uh, a few fish and a few loaves being increased and so we, we want faith to do as best we can with what little we can and, uh, and watch for, for, for some things to happen uh, again I think one thing that saves us is is trying to stay with that holistic view of boy, let's let's work with the family. The family is so valued in the scriptures that we feel that this confirms that okay, if we really work at supporting the family, that that's been helping a lot. And so, uh, I really appreciate the confirmation that we get in terms of, of looking at uh, looking at things from this particular perspective because that's that's what we do. You know, my wife Demetra and I uh, at the church and. Uh, we're very family oriented and, uh, and, and have learned through our own experience of raising four daughters that as much encouragement as we can give children, that that's, that's, that's their oxygen, the encouragement. So whatever we can do to encourage the children and, and especially working with uh, families, uh, the parents in need, that sort of thing, uh, that helps. Because if you look at the challenge, if you focus on the challenges and, 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 uh, and the problems, uh, you can be pretty well overwhelmed. So uh, uh, it really helps, and, and so it helps to have that, that foundation. One, one of the, the, the great joys in my life is I get to, to worship with each of you pretty frequently, once, once a year or so. And, and at your congregation, at your church, uh, one of the things that um, always stands out for me is that your congregation has a special relationship with members and African American members who are in prison. And to, to the point where I, I've heard letters written uh, from, from the, the altar, uh, so that relationship is, is still there. Um, why is it that, that you do that? Why is it that you feel um, it's important for the, the congregation to continue to remain in relationship with those individuals? Thanks for asking that question because I had a thought along those lines that uh, a lot of people aren't aware of the African American experience with prison in some respects in terms of when you look at, look at statistics, I, 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 they, they don't come to mind, but statistically there are a lot of African American males in prison, a lot. And I've talked to, I, I, I've, I've been privileged to work with police officers and so forth and I've learned some of the truth is that there's some police officers who uh, they didn't come up with this idea, but there's been a philosophy that <laughs> uh, the best place for a black man is in prison, and especially uh, if there's uh, some tendency toward emotion showing and things like that. So there's some of those foundational things that are working there, whatever the reason is. And so with us knowing uh, some things like that, and 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 uh, not only knowing but 
uh, just being uh, just being a part of families and knowing families uh, uh, that have uh, have have been affected uh, by this prison situation, uh, we know that uh, there's got to be some work in the prison uh, to help. Uh, they're there, but there's got to be some work going on there. We've been fortunate with folks who have been released from prison prison uh, to come out with a healthier attitude to make things better for themselves and if for children and families and that sort of thing. And if we can get them connected with churches, uh, that also increases to me, and I, I don't have a scientific uh, background, but uh, it increases the opportunity for uh, strength in the family. We know that there's got to be strength in the family, so whatever we can do to reconnect people. Back. And I guess I, I would like to close this with just a, a brief conversation I had with my son about this issue. Told him we were going to do this today. We, we got to talking about um, when I was in high school and one of my classmates became pregnant, what would typically happen is she would disappear. Yep. She would go away and wouldn't hear from her and maybe she'd return after the baby was born, maybe not. And, and when I told that to Jonathan, his, his brow wrinkled a little bit with a little confusion. He wasn't gay. Yeah. And his question was, well, well, Dad, why wouldn't the church and the community want to be supportive of her? And I think to me that crystallizes the, the difficulty of, of this issue. And I, I think I think what really impressed me more than anything you said today, Dr. Mastillo, is that our, our mores have changed and shifted. The genie is out of the bottle. We're not going to be able to go back. To me, the question is, what what is the future? And, and uh, to me, that's the difficult question that we all have to wrestle with. So thank you very much for coming.